behind it. What are we talking about? We're talking about minor CDF configuration. Oh. I'm just sort of like facilitating um, the fact that we're talking about. Um, you know, by the way, people who have the same appreciation of unknown product as I do, I actually have this on the back of a t-shirt. It's very cool. Don't take a photo of me. It's just like normal. Optimizing my.cnf for high write environments. Well, okay, I just wanted I wanted to talk about um, so you know in true form, why don't we just use the website to um, to talk about that? Um, I just want to clarify what people took. I guess we've got an hour, or we've got we've got an hour or so. So let's just break up the time. So I don't want to talk about high write environments, but we should talk about, you know, why not CNF, the things that you should start with, and then we should look at high write as well as like high rewrite, and then the particular implications of different storage engines. Um, I think all those things are relevant. So if we actually have somewhere where we can talk about that. Do we have a particular thing about um, um, why not CNF? Yeah. It's got a capital M, but we don't we don't have a session well, with a description. Yeah. Create a new for it, okay. yeah. Um, create. Um, <coughs> a uh, what is this? A design session. Um, so uh, why not see their configuration? So one thing we want to talk about is probably just uh, a quick overview. Everyone agree they want to have a quick overview? <coughs> yes. No. Maybe. I like the top things because I've got a few slides on those. Um, so I wanted to specifically talk about high ride. Who is the person who requested that? I want to talk about high ride environments. I did. Okay, and then well, maybe we should talk about like high read environments, high ride environments, because high read is more common, and then um, and then high read write. Just you know, read write. You think? I don't know if you can Yes. Is that is that okay? Do those do those four things like help us clarify what we want to talk about? Yes. Yes. All right. So let's just do this. Um, uh, let's just talk about. Um, I'm just going to pull up some sample slides that have some high level properties because then we can talk about. It. Jeremy can tell me how bad I was at writing these. Um, <coughs> No, it's just got some points about different slides, so we can... Um, well, is there a place where you can access these slides? No. Okay. Um. <laughs> Will there be one? Uh, uh, no, these are actually for some presentations which we're not releasing, so what you're seeing is um, you get a lot of typing. I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, what slides can train. <laughs> no, 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 I wrote these myself. I wrote this. <laughs> um, here we go, installation. This is, oh, sorry, I was in the wrong, I was in the wrong one. Um, uh, okay. So, I sort of had a talk and we, we, we came up with what the top 20 configurable parameters. This is sort of like an overview of MyNet CNF. So, the first thing that we should know is um, you need to have a MyNet CNF file. In fact, uh, and, and people may laugh. But there are sites that do not run a MyNotCNF file. I kid you not. Um, and it's important to note that MyNotCNF can be found in different locations. Like by default, it starts on exception.myNotCNF, and then exception.mysql.myNotCNF, and then mysql.home.myNotCNF. You can actually have multiple settings in you have the same setting of multiple files. So you can have a default MyNotCNF file, and then you can have a more custom one that has a different setting for something. So be, be aware of this, because it can catch you out. My best practices is don't use MyNotCNF in EGC. Paul? Does MySQL actually load them all or does it just pick one of them? No, it starts in this order. It works with this order. So if you have slash EGC slash MyNotCNF and then you have created MySQL home environment variable and have MyNotCNF there, it will load EGC MyNotCNF first and then it will go to the next one and then it will go to the next one. Is it loading? What? Should be default extra file. No, it's default file. Because default file, it doesn't create any of the other files. Oh, really? Ah. So there's a way to make it. So um, two settings. Defaults files means read only that file, and defaults extra file 
means redo position. Using in the order of those ones that you have up there. So actually, you should completely remove default's file from there. Yeah, or, so or put it at the end, end saying, end. yeah. What I should sort of say, uh, or you override the whole yeah, thing I was just going to put exactly that override, which is ridiculous. So if you want to override, you just use defaults file. Um, now, if you want to use these defaults, it's file equals. So I think it probably goes in that order. Yeah. That's a good point. And that actually means that the MySQL manual is wrong. So pull up the manual. Another one. Another one. Yeah, shoot. This is why Jeremy's the heater bag, everything that I'm going to tell you. <laughs> He's very good at it. The data appears. Actually, I don't think NC-SQL is right by default. But the data is right in that position. NC-SQL is right on Debian. Oh, actually, MySQL, yeah, that, this, this, is, this is sort of like new. And so it's more, as you said, probably Debian, which is right. Well, is it in, like under like under that you have un, dollar sign MySQL underscore home? Isn't well, it just MySQL underscore like data dear? Yeah. Oh. Okay, uh, data slash my.cnf. And then MySQL home is only going to be read if you define the variable MySQL home. If you don't define the environment variable, then it won't be set. It won't work. So and what about, um, can you put, can't you put ones on the command line itself? Well, this is just for my.cnf, yeah. So you can, there, well, you can pass arguments to the, to the option, to the command line, MySQL D, MySQL D safe. Uh, or you can put them in a my.cnf file. Right, you've got to be aware if you put something on the command line, it will probably squash everything over the configuration file. That was my question, is where does it happen? Is it the very, yeah. would it be the last yeah, one that it, anything on the command line overrides? If you have, if you use multiple paths, you will get caught because you'll expect something to be set and it won't get set. So if you have more than one instance on your server, my advice is do not use except for my.cnf. Use a specific one you best on the file. Specify the command line or MySQL home.mycnf. Because when you start cascading options, you don't know where it's actually come from. And then you can also set them global. But a lot of options are dynamically set in the server. So your server starts up and someone says, oh, you know, we can turn this on or up this. So they up it and they don't change the configuration file. So just be aware. Um, that's a good. So that's a good point. Just print defaults, print out each file, and tell you where it doesn't tell you where it's come from, but it'll tell you where the variables are. It'll tell you the yeah the total settings. Yeah, print defaults will tell you what will happen if you run it like that. So it doesn't tell you where it comes from, and it doesn't tell you whether or not it's actually overridden any of the defaults either. You know, so if there's something that's a certain size of like eight megs by default, it doesn't tell you you have overridden this. Or I guess it does. It tells you the default file, right? But it doesn't tell you if you've actually. It count the command line, though. What'd you say? I don't think it counts the command. It does. Line. Okay. Not it's easily to, testable, but it, it does. Not to spend all the time on this. It's just like, just be aware that this will catch you out, you know, as well as uh, also on online, uh, also on command line. Yeah, you're right. Actually, it does. Um, so just there are things that we need to spend more time on. We don't quite have a lot of time because we want to get through to actually configuring things. But I wanted to, <coughs> when someone asked me. Which parameters do you set? We tried very hard to create a subset. Um, and so these are the ones that we figured that were important. Now Jeremy will tell us otherwise. Setting max connections is important. Oh, okay. Two things about my.cnf. One, I've seen environments where they don't have a my.cnf file in production. I'm not joking. So it's important to have one. Second, only this week I was at a site where they configured my.cnf and I was reviewing it and going, where are the log files? They're not in the right spot. And you look at the log, you look at the my.cnf file correctly and they have the top line wrong. Rather than having left square bracket, mysql d, like right square bracket, which then defines the arguments for mysql d, they had a mistake. So all of the settings, while they're in the my.cnf file, weren't actually in the server. So just be aware of that because, and if you have that and then you fix it, then your server won't start. Because if you're running INODB, it'll use the default and you've gone, I've got to change the INODB settings. You said it won't actually reboot. So we can take more of that offline. Um, max connections is important. If you set max connections to 5,000, then that's just bad. Good luck with that. Um, there is a work log for, uh, the, what, the reason why is one connection is one thread in the server. So when you have too many connections, they, they're just actually doing too much work um, of what they're actually trying to do. So, you know, 100, 100 is a good place to start. A, a high-powered, you know, four-core machine, you know, 1,000 is like about the maximum you're going to go to. Um, you would use up at more than 1,000 to be like, if you have anything, yeah, I've been, I, people, people started at like 1,000 or something like that, and I go, forget it, make it 100. 
And they go, okay, but we have like two web servers, Java servers. Java, fantastic. Set those connection pools to like 40. There you go, it's fine. If you have PHP, it's a little more complicated. Um, basically, basically, it places a maximum limit on the number of queries that MySQL can ever try to run simultaneously. And you'd be lucky to run 10 at a time, let alone a thousand. So, so if it doesn't serve any purpose making max connections high. It really doesn't. To, to give you some example, we, we've set our connections high only because we want to know when it, um, yes. when it dies. Because if, if you get to too many connections, right, it won't allow more connections, but you'll get an error that says too many connections. So you have to, you have to know where enough trade-off is, right, because you don't want it to go and then, you know, MySQL will hang if you do have too many, you know, queries running at a time. But we have a really, really high traffic site, and if we have anything more than, like, 200 connections, we'll just keep going up. You know, if there's something wrong and something slow somewhere and everything just goes up. So even with really, really high traffic site, I mean, 200 is more than enough. I see this misconfigured a lot. So rule of thumb, you know, people, when I say like 100, they're like shocked. And yeah. I go, well, let's just, let's address the problem of why you have more than 100 connections before you increase it over 100. Right, right. And better to get the too many connections errors than to have some runaway query so far, take down. Say, well, we run 1,200, it works fine. 1,400. 1,400 down. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was like, yeah, so, but I was talking about like power, that's like an example of that, but. But now, the, the reason for that is that, um, like we, uh, from our, uh, from, sir, from our application servers, we need to have a certain number of uh, connections open from each one. And what we do is we keep recycling them, so, and we have like alerts and um, things that kick in if like you reach more than, you know, like 400 threads actually running. But we don't ever go there. We, what we have is like, we allow like uh, 1,400 connections, but at most the threads that actively run is just 10 or 12. Yeah. We just have like connections, like just so they can, uh, Java application can keep the connections open. Now, just, you know, this is part of the community. So there is a work log for decoupling connections with threads. So you can have a lot more connections with threads. Um, and there is actually, there's a work log to actually do that. Um, which means that you know we're promoting to actually have the client. Um, there are clients out there that modify our source code and use it, and I know for a fact there's a client that does this, and they and I've tested it for 25,000 database connections. Okay, and only 20 threads. So internally, it's a, even at 25,000 possible connections because they have thousands of application servers. When I say thousands, I mean thousands, not just hundreds. Um, and so, and they need to have like like two or three connections to the database. But internally, there's no more than 20 actually doing the work. It just shows that even like with the high ones. Um, thread cache is something that handles internally. Thread caches are being used. Um, you can change that number. I just picked the default of 16. But, um, it's actually worth noting that the default thread cache is zero, which is really bad. Yeah, you should set that. <laughs> the difference between zero and non-zero is much more interesting than trying to get it perfect. So thread. Cache size default of zero is bad. The set of default the eight, six, six, six. and you can look at certain things to work out what what your thread usage is. Right. Um, is isn't there some some kind of um, starting formula like x number of times of the cores you have or no? Not really. But if you start from zero, there's no good way to guess what it should be. Right. But right. Um, basically, just keep increasing it until threads created stops increasing. Threads underscore so created in creating any threads. Threads underscore created in show status. status. So increase until, until <laughs> thread, uh, optimally you should start the server. It should create 32 threads created. and it should never need any more ever. No, something like that. Stops increasing. Wish we had time to actually go through running servers to show you these things. Um, IDB thread concurrency is one of those fantastic things depending on your operating system. Baham, oh, sorry, I actually talked about table cache. Table cache is really important that you set this appropriately. It's the number of file descriptors that you need, and in 5.1 it changes into two variables, table open cache and table cache definitions, something like that. But in 5.0, uh, if you set it really low, like this example 256, that's a good example to say, if you have more than a few tables in your database with a lot of users, you will start seeing opened tables, open tables and opened tables. And if open tables is continuing to grow, then you're actually getting file handles. And so you should increase table cache until open tables effectively doesn't grow. Open. Opens, yes. So the one to look for here for table cache 
is the same thing as, as last time, you know, increase, uh, yeah, until, this is until, uh, increase <coughs> until status opens, tables, stops increasing. <coughs> and then open tables is what is presently used. And also, it's actually a MySQL command, which I haven't actually used, but there's a show open tables. I've never really used it, but I think it will actually list what's open from that. Is that right? Yeah. Not terribly... Actually, we usually set it to like 4,096. Yeah, so I was going to say, you know, 2,048, 4,096, 8,000. Um, the thing to note is, is that when you increase table cache a lot more, you have to also increase open files limit, depending on what operating system you're using. So they sort of like, you know, marry up. But the new operating systems, you know, the, it's because it ties in with like the new limit. Yes, yep. the new non mixed operating system. <laughs> Ubuntu and Debian both have a very low limit for that. So, I mean, if you increase table cache too much, the server just won't start and say it doesn't have enough open file descriptors or something like that, which means you have to increase open files. I don't think that's true. I think I it think is. It will start and fail opening tables later. Well, <laughs> this is this, this is good because sometimes you don't see these things in German systems, or at least a lot of them. Um, IDB thread concurrency, you have to be using IDB. And the general rule is two times the number of CPUs, not two times the number of cores. However, uh, it depends on your environment. So when we start talking about high write later, um, Vahan at the back is going to go, you know, we run 32, 64? 64. 64 for this number under Solaris. And it's, you know, MySQL will say, you know, don't increase it. And then he has a classic example where he has increased and seen huge improvement in performance. So that's one that will come up when we talk about a little bit more. Um, for memory, um, you need to have a key buffer size, even if you have no INODB. MySQL internally uses uh, INODB, and if you have 10... So we'll just say, oh sorry, um, my, my ISAM is actually the internal tables of my ISAM, so even if it's all INODB tables, you still actually have my ISAM. So you can't just like set it to zero. And if you have... Uh, default table type, you're going to specify that's my ISAM, so when temporary tables get created, they're my tables as well. So you do have to have that. If you're just running my ISAM in a high run environment, you can't go by 4 I don't even buffer pool size will be the most important one that people will misconfigure if they're running just one ODB. 70 to 80% RAM. So you get systems with 16 gig, V2 gig. Now, Jeremy is saying up to 90%. So the advantage of that is you get as much of your data in memory as possible. The disadvantage is recovery time increases when your server crashes. So that combined with uh, log file size, which is not going to be log file size, which is not here, has a big bearing on recovery. So there's a trade-off between performance and recovery. And I start promoting recovery a lot more. It's a bug. It's a bug. What a bug. The size of buffer pool should not affect recovery time. Um, but it does because what happens is that, is that... It does, but it should. Well, it does because the more data you have in memory, the higher you set your, your flushing of dirty pages into disk, the more data that's held in memory, which is actually not actually flushed and checkpointed. Sure. So therefore, there's more transactions in the log files until the log files are the checkpoint. Let me try to understand. Are you saying there's a way they should do it that it work better? Well, I think you, we're talking about two different things. It actually yeah. affects recovery time in two different ways. Well, it affects recovery time because your usage of IDB buffer causes more stuff to have to be recovered. Yeah. Combination of block calls. Peter Zeitz found some interesting points around just the size of buffer pool causing recovery to be much slower. Yeah, than it should be. And then recovering of the smaller buffer pool was much faster and then restarting with the real buffer pool size later. Yes. After recovery. The process is much faster. Anyway, in terms of like parameters, it's a key parameter that you want. Um, query cache size and query cache limit, as long as well as query cache type, is for the MySQL query cache, which is very good in a high write environment and very bad. Sorry, very good in a high read environment and very bad in a high write environment. So the high writer, you turn the query cache off big time because it's an overhead. Um, Temp table size and max heap table size are very important for internally, internal temporary tables. 
I generally reset this on most sites I go to because you look in the status variables and there will be created disk temporary tables. And there are three causes for that. And <coughs> one of those causes is that your internal temporary table size is not big enough. Okay? There are other reasons, but for the purposes of that, um, those things will go. Um, there are a lot more session buffers than then just these four. I'd like to give you an idea. There are... Um, That's how many per session thread buffers. I think there are. There's probably even ones that are missing from that. Um, so there's quite a lot. But if you just look at the key ones, sort, join, read, and read, rand, depending on top of operations that you're doing. So again, if you're using a default configuration, these can be quite small. It's important too that if you set these globally in your server, like in your minor CNF file, if you have a particular query that you run, that requires something that's a bigger buffer for some purpose, like it's pulling back a lot of data and it's going to do a sort on it. That's something that's important, but it doesn't sort of run out of OLTP all the time. It's sort of like a, a thread that may be loading data. You can actually set these things on a per session basis. So we're talking about might not see parameters. You've got to realize there's global ones and then there's per session ones. So you can actually change these on a particular query or a particular connection. So just be aware of those. Um, um, well, well, we're talking about CNF, so my, 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 my suggestion is always turn on log slow queries, mainly because no one has monitoring in place and I don't know if what queries are running slow. I always say set long slow query time to one, people sort of want me to make it two. Um, the granularity is still, it's, granularity is impractical now for most applications, but if you have it as low as possible, at least it's giving you some output that you can analyse and say, well, these are bad queries. And so you review it every day and you look at the top running by time and then the ones running by frequency. Um, I should have put IDB log files earlier. So IDB log file size is important for the types of transactions that you're doing along with log files in groups which defaults to two. Um, some of the recommendations is set the log files to half the size of the buffer pool divided by log files in group. However, if your buffer pool size is like 12 gig, for a 16 gig machine, you know, so they're saying make the log file size 3 gig, that's totally impossible <coughs> because what that means is that up to 6 gigabyte of transactions could in theory be in your log files and they have to be replayed in a crash situation. Would you make them greater than 512, I think? Not really. No. Usually run 512 or something 68. Yeah. But I you would can agree. Actually make the total size bigger than 4 gigs. Uh, I should also mention that that is true. So, for example, if we, if we use that equation for 6 gig, you would be in trouble. Um, so, weird things happen if you would have Yeah. Um, combined size must be less than 4 gigabytes. Um, recommendation would be 512 to 768 and um, 2 log file in group. So, the largest you'd go to, I agree with that, 512. Um, I mean, there are a lot of parameters. I'm just going through. We just picked like 20 to cover things, so it's a good introduction because we're about of introduction time. Wait timeout, interaction timeout, interaction timeout depends on how your connections close. So it depends on how your connections are coming in and you're monitoring those. Transaction isolation is not really relevant here because it's <coughs> split as default. Um, particularly when you get to 5.1, because in 5.1 you can't. You know, in 5.1 you can't use different transaction isolation levels with row with um, statement-based replication. Yeah. yeah. So if you go to like read, if you go to read committed, it says you have to switch to using row-based replication. Um, I'm just going to give you this link. Seriously, um, I say this because I'm just going to get up this way here. Um, this is the most used page I use in the manual. 5.0 documentation. Section 521, option and variable reference, which lists all the variables and options that we just talked about. Um, um, so what I just talked about, for example, here, um, we were just talking about like max connections, for example. Um, you know, here's max connections. And there are certain variables, it's important to know these 
what these columns do because the one on the end it says it's dynamic which means that you can actually change this variable dynamically in the server so if you have, are having a problem you, some of them you have to reboot the server, some of them you don't have to reboot the server you can just actually change them in the MySQL client um, so this index page will list you, let you go to different things like you know, Max Connections will then drill down and document just give you some information number of simultaneous collections uh, by default of 100 in 5.1 it goes to 150 I think um, and then this is the most common area where you see the error too many connections now copyrighted and trademarked by those people at the back who run their own uh, job advertising website called too many connections Could you put the URL for that article in the uh, yeah, I've already got, I've already got it there. Uh, so here, um, option tables, there's a link there. Bookmark, there's a page. Um, in fact, what I should actually do is there's a different window. Um, so yeah, definitely grab that page. It's easier to tab into the windows. So definitely grab that because we're going to talk about more of these. Um, so that's just like a really quick overview of some of them. So we want to talk about high, um, let's just start about with high right because we're going to talk about high right straight away. Um, quick overview. Oh, well, we want to, we want to do high right, high right first because that was a specific question. Jeremy. High right environment. Give us the ones you would set first. Well, what's what's high right? Like, what's that threshold that you would consider? Oh, I guess that's a good question. Are we talking about I need to be only, or I need to be in my SAM, or my ISAM only, or we don't know which storage engine we're using? Both, or all three memory tables too. Well, okay. So this is a problem because uh, depends on storage engines. So, which is the most common environment you want to talk about? Because it changes depending on what you want to do. I mean, my ISAM is fantastic for high write. You know, you can have concurrent inserts. Single writing. It's single writing, but it's very good for doing contiguous writing. You know, um, for anything that's, that's read and insert only, we use my ISAM. And anything that's doing any updates, we use the DB. Right. Well, the first thing to know is deletes are bad. What's that? Deletes. Well, you shouldn't generally do online deletes unless you have to. I mean, people go do deletes because they make an application easier, but if you can turn deletes into an archiving process, then it's more efficient to do it in a batch process. That's my take on it. Well, maybe, yeah. I mean, it depends on many things. Um, so, what are you going to set? It's hard because if you start mixing storage <coughs> engines, you're really making life difficult for yourself. So, let's just say INODB, right? If you're doing INODB, you want a uh, INODB Buffer pool size. If you're using, if you're doing a high write environment with an ODB, which is actually our most common case, and it will be normally recommended in fact for high write environments, uh, the first thing actually is to look at the hardware. Uh, so that if you plan on doing a high write environment, you need hardware RAID, RAID 10. Yep. Battery back run cache. So fast right back disk, RAID 10. Once you get all that out of the way, then you can look at the ODB configuration. Yep. And so they're good terms. So if you're if you're doing a high write environment, <coughs> NDB, you basically absolutely need a hardware RAID with battery back write cache. Uh, you can do it without it, but it's really scary. Um, and you have to you have to make all kinds of tweaks to get good performance out of it, which means that you lose any concept of transactions, and transactional integrity, and all that. So, um, Go, going with that, just uh, as far as just the hardware, I don't know whether it was your stuff or maybe Peter that does. There was something that when you had written about uh, not necessarily getting better performance from more disks, yeah. uh, as long as you just had a couple, of, you know, fast-rated disks. Why? Why wouldn't you get uh, better performance with more disks um, for across? You. So it, it depends. You sort of do and sort of don't. Um, and that actually bridges off into a whole hardware discussion. But yeah, the, a very big one. Uh, <laughs> really big one. But the it basically comes down to the fact that MySQL is provided you have lots of work on effectively different things from different threads coming in, you can make a fairly okay use of all those disks, but uh, MySQL is very dependent on the latency of the on disk subsystem more than, say, Oracle would be. So it's actually doing a lot of waiting and not a lot of writing. <coughs> um, 
and that's part of the reason that you need the hardware RAID with battery back write caches because that takes a lot of latency out of the equation so that the device can throw more work at the system because the latency is basically zero. Uh, and it, it's just basically that internally at NLDB it's not sending work to the disks that it could be because it's waiting on something else to come back from the disks. So the latency thing is a good point. Um, that's like a lot of people use sand now. Sand increases latency time. So you might have very fast sand, but your latency time does increase as well. So that, that's part of the, the equation. And then the other part is that a lot of people, especially if you're looking at lots and lots of disks, you're, you, have, you, you have some complex queries that you're trying to speed up. But in my scope, can make absolutely no good use of lots of disks for a single query. And that's because of lack of parallelization within single query. Single query will always run on a single CPU and basically use a single disk. Um, in a RAID system, it's going to be better performance because of strike and such, but it's not going to make use of like a 40 disk RAID array. It's going to, you're going to have two or three disks that are, that are really busy and then spread across the whole, the whole system sort of striking as it goes, but it's not going to issue an outstanding IO to keep all 40 disks busy by far. You see two or three, how about four or five or six? So sort of where's the breakpoint there? The, it, it really depends on the workload, but I'd say you don't see too many MySQL systems with more than maybe 10 disks. Um, you said 20 dimension returns. Yeah, really, really steep, actually. Um, and yeah, that, that really depends on the workload. But what, what about breaking the log files and, and data on the different disks? Put it all in a big rate, strike it across all the disks. Historically, that was good before, like break things. But the problem, one of the definite, you improve performance historically, but you you, you actually impact your disaster recovery. Keeping that. Yeah. So, I so it's, <coughs> a big, it's a big minus. It's a, a big plus. You know, historically, for quantity hardware, if you just had like single drives, maybe. Um, but um, it'll mess up your recovery every time. So part part of the answer to that is actually that uh, if you so if you imagine like an interview scenario. Typically people want to take like a, you have six disks available, so you take like four of those, make them a rate 10, two of them make them a rate one, put the log, put the data on the four disks, put the logs on the two disks. <coughs> but what will happen is that, you know, NODB, provided you have a hardware array with battery back write cache, um, you know, NODB is going to, is going to be writing all the time to the logs, but it's going to get aggregated into chunks, which are written every few seconds from the battery back write cache. Uh, so basically your two disks, which you've dedicated to the logs, are going to be almost completely idle. Sequential write, and it's only you know, once a second maybe. Uh, so basically, those two disks are would have been capable of another, depending on the speed of the disks, 150 to 250 random writes. Uh, or on the read side, since they're potentially a rate 10, you know, 300 to 500 random reads per second that you're just wasting. Uh, so in those scenarios, you know, you're talking a limited number of disks and such. It would be better to just have a single rate 10 across all six disks and make use of all of them simultaneously. So you well, say the so battery back write cache will take care of your concerns about getting the logs to disk in a reasonable fashion, given that they're sequential I/O. So just to clarify, we've got here: if you use four by rate ten um, for data and two by rate one for logs, um, battery backup write cache will negate performance that you see performance improvements you'd see. For the most part, um, I mean, there are, there are very you know, if you're looking on a particular very specific problem space where you could potentially get some more percentage performance out of splitting things across multiple disks and such. But actually what, what Ronald was mentioning was that disaster recovery gets a lot more complicated. Once you put the, the data and the logs on separate volumes, there's no guarantee that they're consistent between each other. The snapshot and NODB gets very, very upset if the logs and the data don't perfectly match. Uh, on top of that, you also lose the ability to snapshot NODB. Okay, so you can't snapshot two volumes atomically. Yeah. All right. I, I don't want to hijack this, but what about it? What if it, it, it's a master? Sorry. This is good. I'm oh, okay. I said you were saying hijacking. Yeah, you're hijacking. Oh, hijacking. Uh, what about if that's a master to, to a number of slaves? You, I mean, you're, you're now Let's talk about that replication. Oh, okay. Because that's a good topic for replication about how you configure things like disk and stuff. Okay. Um, so just one thing I want to add to that. Most people don't use RAID 10, but RAID 10 for database work is more efficient because you're not actually writing in parity. So incurring that extra, incurring the second write is actually better. However, I do not have times for recovery of a rate 10 disk over the recovery of a rate 5 disk. Substantially better. Substantially better. But it's still actually pulling from one disk rather than actually pulling from all disks. So, yeah, so it's important to note because most people go with rate 5, but rate 10 is better for database disk. And if you're doing high write, again, markedly better. Um, better than rate 5. 
Yeah, so the other part of that is that if you lose a disk in a rate of five, it's going to pull parity from every disk. Yeah, you, you, your performance like goes to hell. Yeah. But if you lose a disk in a rate ten, the performance actually marginally improves because you no longer have to write I/O to that disk to both disks. You're writing it to only one disk, so performance is actually better while you have a failed disk. And then it fails again. <laughs> And so this is important too because if you're a high run environment and someone says to me, okay, well, you know, and, and I recommend, you know, if you have a choice, choose like dual Opron, dual cores over, um, you know, uh, dual core, dual CPU Opron over Intel. That's the general way I recommend because the Opron is like a newer processor chipset. But then someone says, oh, okay, but. Not anymore. Well, the newer Intel's maybe? Yeah. Yeah, so but if, yeah, core twos. But if you're talking like Xeon and stuff like that, then Optron is definitely better than Xeon. Not better than the newest one. The newest one. Well, not better than the newest ones, but the old technology one. Okay, um, but then someone says, okay, but I'm going to get 10k drives on one and then 15k drives on the other one. Depends what your environment is. If your environment's high right, then you want to go for the fastest speed. Just simply because the time it takes for your disk to spin to write data. Because you're writing more to write more data. However, the battery backup cage will help with that as well. So the flush. So um, we should probably talk about uh, INODB, INODB, flush, trans, what is that, add commit? Look up that wrong, haven't I? Flush log at TRS commit. Flush log at TRS commit. Yeah, I've got to read the wrong way. Um, this is important to set for improved performance. What was that right? Well, if you set it to one, then your performance isn't going to improve. We want to, we want to get this discussion. You know, it's now the start this discussion. Uh, <laughs> There's a few settings for it. Um, you can forego some, some. Basically, you can you can take the risk of data loss, but not loss of transactional integrity by setting it to zero or two. Zero or two are two values that basically say either. Write occasionally or write occasionally but more frequently. <coughs> uh, and then one forces it to write every single transaction to block, uh, which means that you guarantee that it's on disk somewhere, so you guarantee you don't lose anything provided you get an okay from your commit. Uh, if you set it to any other value than one, uh, then there's a possibility that you lose committed data, but nonetheless, provided you're using transactions correctly, the data, database itself will still be consistent. When you say lose data, it's generally less than one second of data. So I'm not talking a lot of data. Because it just will generally flush on a per second basis. Well, there's a lot of transactions that can happen in a second. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're doing which second. It depends which second. Like, if you're doing, uh, if you're doing like 12,000 transactions a second, then I'm serious, you know, if you're doing that, then, you know, you can lose a lot of data. So, but then the performance really kills you. And the bigger issue is you don't know which data you lost. Yeah. Because it's gone, so. <laughs> So which, uh, and in fact, NODB will exacerbate the problem because on boot, NODB will mm -hmm. then truncate your binary logs when it does its recovery, thus really losing anything that you had previously. Now we are talking, you know, we're talking disaster situations when MySQL crashes, you know, so. Which, um, which setting is more scalable? Number two? Zero. Scalable? Yeah, for a higher, allowing more concurrency of writing. Hey, you you want to lose data? data? Yeah, I don't mind losing data. Okay, yeah. zero. Set it to zero. Zero. What's the difference in zero to two? Two writes more frequently. Yes. Okay. Is there any plan in the future to make the table of granularity for this? So you can have like a plan for the actual table? That's a good question. Always flush. I don't think it's possible though, actually. It, it could be possible. That's the wrong part of the code. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> uh, equal seven. It, it, it basically affects the whole No, it's not only me we're talking about, so it, your question should be directed to yourself. Uh, Alright. Well, because Falcon is going to be the transaction engine that we're going to be promoting soon. Okay. 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 <laughs> Jeremy will say, and I don't disagree with Jeremy, Jeremy will say 5.1. Oh, who knows when that's going to get released? Um, 6.0, which is Falcon. Well, who knows when that's going to get released? So I'm a realist. No, 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 no. Let me finish. Let me finish. When is 5.1 going to get released? Well, when are people actually going to really use it in production? When is 6.0 going to get released? 6.0 is a dot .0 release with a new storage engine. No one's going to use that until it's 6.1. And Jeremy's point is going to be, well, a year after 6.1 is out, then we'll be using Falcon. And that'll be basically your point of view. Something like that. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with it. Put it this way, it's going to be a while. Unless you want to do bleeding edge things now, Falcon is seriously, you know, 
something you don't want to put on your schedule in under two years. That's just my ballpark figure. If you want to, re if you want to be really, if you're a large environment and you, and you like consistency and being stable, I mean, you've got to wait until 6.0 is out, maybe even some of the advanced features in 6.1, and you might want to let it sit around for six months and, you know, and then a few dot releases, if you're serious about it. So INDB, unfortunately, will be around for a long time. So the specific question was basically around could it be table-based? I think the answer is for the foreseeable future, not really. Because it affects rights to the logs. Yep. And well, logs are shared logs. for all tables, all databases, all table spaces. So it could potentially be done if, if it were possible to instantiate multiple NMDBs within a single server, basically. But that, that's likely never going to happen. Um, okay, so very quickly, because we want to wrap up here, uh, uh, IDNB transaction track, track flush method, you can sort of set that to like overrect, depending on, depends on if you like running Linux, running Solaris or SANS, then you know, it gets messy. Um, but you know, default Linux, I would set flush commit to overrect. Flush method? Yeah, flush method, overrect. Yeah, yep, that's what I would recommend. And actually, I think we agree. Yeah, we agree. Overrect is the only way to go. Actually, what, what that does is basically it, it passes the odirect flag to the fopen call for opening NLDB's actual files, which causes it to bypass uh, all of the, it's basically a Linux only option, but it causes it to bypass all of the caching in Linux, basically. So access the files directly. When you open a file with odirect that has a lot of implications on how you do IOs to the file system, like you have to read and write only in 4K blocks. You can't read and write in any other amount. Since NMDB uses 16K pages, it doesn't really matter. It always reads in 16K, which is a multiple of 4K, so it works perfectly. Um, but that means that Linux doesn't try to do its own page caching or anything for NMDB's files, uh, which is much, much more efficient. And that's all flavored in the Unix. I mean, Linux, uh, CentOS OS. Yeah, it works on all Linux systems, and it works, I think, on a few other Unix y operating systems, but I couldn't name you which one it works on. Excuse me, I'm, I was going to stop the document that no one's able to look at and pull out the configuration file. So I'll be back with <laughs> Bear with me. So when you have it to a direct, it reads, does it read in 16 kilobytes? Well, it's always going to do every I.O. in 16K chunks anyway. Uh -huh. So you basically get O direct for free. Because I mean, the biggest caveat with O direct is that you have to do everything in 4K chunks. So if you're going to write your own program and open something with O direct, it can be really difficult to make that work. <laughs> but since NMDB always does things in 16K chunks, it's just four, 4K blocks, so uh, the kernel is perfectly okay to, to service that. Because of the fact that it's bypassing all the caching, you can't ask for one byte, because you will have to read 4K, and it has no place to store that 4K, and pull out your one byte. Gotcha. Because it's bypassing all of that layer. So it has to return you the entire buffer that it reads from the disk. Um, pick the next one. What? I said pick the next one you want to talk about. I'm just trying to find a sample file um, just so that we can we can talk about it. Um, one. Well, I've just got one here. It's not an ideal. This is one we can talk about, which was like an early preposition, so we can actually talk about um, uh, what's right and what's wrong in it, which is really where we want to go. So I just do that. I just do that. I mean, I don't care about telling you where I work, but someone will tell someone and then I'll get in trouble. So, um, so here's an interesting thing, and this was actually Solaris, so, um, but, um, uh, connection stable cache, and this was like, it was a very small transaction, actually, this might actually, this might not have been an IDB file that I think about it. Um, so we talked about um, sort buffer, join buffer, read buffer, and read ran buffer. Um, these will uh, these will depend on what types of queries that you're doing. Um, this is production. No, this is like just filming around. Yeah, you, you can't put comments on the end. Fine. Um, just get it. Oh, it works. Sometimes it works. <laughs> if, the, if the particular piece reading that code trims the line, then it works. But there are some cases where if you put a comment on the line, like a file name. You'll actually end up with the comment as part of your file. Okay. Because the entire thing, the entire line is returned. 
Yeah, well, that might be an IDB specific thing down here for like buffer. I think so, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I mean, the buffers will depend on the types of queries that you're doing. So it's hard to talk about those things specifically. Um, Max Kurtzweig is actually a good one. Yeah. Frank. Frank's not here. Um, let, let's, let's actually talk about that. Uh, Max, in uh, fact, let's pull up the manual for that. And does anyone understand the formula to calculate Max Kurtzweig? <laughs> Has anyone heard of that? To calculate what? Max Kurtzweig. <laughs> we, get, <laughs> we get grins and nods from the <laughs> I don't know what his friend told yeah. him about it. Yeah, Max Spread Lag is interesting. I didn't read the block of the manual where it talks about Well, here it is here. The variable controls have to delay inserts, update, delete operations when the purge operations are lagging. This is implemented for multi versioning, which is on ODB. Maintains a list of transactions that have delete mark index records for updates or deletes. Length of time is some magical calculation, which is there. Purge lag divided by max purge lag times 10 minus 5 milliseconds. Um, and so, IDB will have this background thread which will flush stuff to disk. And you set it to 900,000 or something? Uh, no, 70,000. 70,000. You set it to a very large number, which means don't flush, don't flush, flush the uh, updated delete records to disk as often. And you do that for improving That's the level of disk guy. But it'll, it'll kill everyone. No, no, it basically... Well, no, it'll kill everyone. The default is zero, which means effectively no delays. But what that means is that Max Perkline delays write transactions in order to allow time to... Collect them. Not so much to, to actually free space. If you, with, the, with the default of zero, it will never delay a write because there's no place to write it. So it will cause your table space to grow and grow. Uh, so it will never... Basically, it will never make time to, to, to delete things. So if you delete a record, it's just delete marked, which is where the <coughs> discussion comes in. So it will never actually go back and clean that up. Uh, it tries to periodically, but if the database is busy, it doesn't have any opportunity to do that. Uh, so you can force it to reclaim them by adjusting that number. Yeah, for both the I do the updates and delete. And the problem with that is that if you have any positive uh, number set for this, then you cannot get uh, a trustworthy snapshot by issuing things. a plus table with read log. Because once you do that, it will still keep doing, uh, you know, purging the deleted records. And uh, the timestamps and the checksums of uh, MDB files will keep changing. But you're talking, yes, yes. you can still snapshot. Yeah, but the snapshot so, 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 so. under heavy load, if you have like, we have 70,000, uh, it's up to 70,000. So if we issue a plus table with read log, the snapshot we get, InnoDB cannot recover from it. So in other words, the snapshot is crashed. Wait, how are you taking the snapshot? Well, so uh, when we use like FS snap for Solaris, but it's similar to LVM on Linux. That shouldn't affect snapshot ability. This is actually no, back no, it takes a snapshot, but the, the You're going to talk about this in your okay. whole half an hour session. Well, so you can't so. recover a snapshot. I'm thinking it shouldn't affect the ability to recover a snapshot. It does somehow. Because if it were to affect the ability to recover a snapshot, you also wouldn't be able to survive a power failure. Uh, with this, yeah. What, what would happen is you would have data pages that are marked crash, and upon reading, upon starting up, InnoDB will keep restarting itself. And you can go to a force recovery 6 and get it to, uh, you can, you know. We should talk about that. <laughs> so you're I not convinced. What's your recommended value? Okay. I did. Recommended value, Jeremy. It really depends. If you if you have problems keeping up with deletes, then you have to set it to a non-zero value. Um, so basically, I mean, the symptom of that is hard to diagnose, but it, it basically, you're deleting data, so your, your total amount of data hasn't changed, but the database keeps growing uh, because there's just no time to actually delete any of the any of the data and free that space to be reused. The default of zero is okay for most people because they're not 100% you know, busy 24/7, but if you are, or if you have some you know, particular batch jobs and such that are deleting a lot of records and you need to get that data back so that you don't grow every day, that sort of stuff, you have to set it to non-zero. What value it actually should be is unclear. It, it's related to the amount of time you're willing to take to free things up. Right. We have delete a lot of data. If you delete a lot of data every night, then what should be the value for that? Then what will be, what should the value be? Yeah. If you don't have problems keeping up, the value of zero is, is okay. 
if you're deleting data, like let's say you do a nightly delete of 10% of your data, yeah, like that, that, which 10, 20, is typical in like a batch processing system, yeah. then um, and you're you're really busy all day with writes, you might set it to 10,000, 20,000, something like that. It's basically it's like microseconds or something is the unit, but it's sort of it's the number of indirect value. You know? you, it's the number of records that can exist unpurged in the in deep. It's not number of seconds that there. It's okay. the actual number. So for 70,000, you would allow at, at most 70,000 unpurged records to exist in your data space. Unpurged. Like, I mean, pages. Huh? Pages, not records. Records. So it, it's like, that's how many records it can hold in the, uh, what, what is it called? Um, like the, it, it, the background thread, thread would at any time have that many records at most to um, uh, to actually delete from the... Uh, it sounds like it be internal discussion. <laughs> I sat in on a discussion with uh, Tobias on Friday last week, a couple of hours of ANDB, and I spent, and I know, but, you know, a little about my SQL, <coughs> and I spent like two hours writing constant notes and asking all these questions about the internal. So it's like, well, I learned two hours worth of stuff. So it's very scary. Um, very scary to very It's really about. annoying that Max Kurtz line is an indirect value, though. The number that you calculated is it's impossible to understand unless you know all of the NDB internals. Okay, moving right along because we're going to run out of time. Um, I don't even Max. Dirty pages percent defaults to 90. I've never changed it, but I think maybe it's a good point to discuss whether you want to change it. You ever said you set up to 95 or set down to 60, or what do you do? Again, that sort of depends on the rate level. What do you set yours to? Um, you have it at 90? 90 is pretty high. Yeah. No, we we uh, we have like I think 45. 45. Okay. I mean, if I were to do anything with it, I'd say lower it. Yeah. What it really does is it causes shutdown time to be really really long. With 90% dirty pages of a 14 gig buffer pool, that is a lot of data that can be dirty that has to be flushed on shutdown. I've seen shutdown take 20 or 30 minutes. Is it by default 0 or 95? I believe by default is 90. 90. 90. So lower it for large environments. It will affect runtime performance, obviously. EG, you know, um, 60, 45. Uh, the larger the bay, the longer a normal shutdown can take. Um, lowering value will decrease <coughs> online OLTP. Okay. Good agree? Sounds good. So, the, um, missing a zero. Um, Thank you. Um, I don't need to be locked wait timeout. I've played around with that a little bit. I don't really understand exactly what it does, but you just play around. Maximum amount of transactions you need to wait. Sure. So you know, if you're if you're running a system where your transactions just can't handle, you know, been running for a really long time, you can really decrease it. The false fifty seconds. Just say. The default is actually pretty high for yeah. what my is typically used for, which is web stuff. No one on the web is going to wait fifty seconds. Yeah. The time I'd only be will wait. The unfortunate transaction. Is, you know, if you said it's really low, you basically have to restart your transaction if you if you time out. So um, you could end up having to restart the same transaction many times. But at least during that process, you can give the user some feedback because you're not just blocking, waiting for something to come back. But if you're an OLTP system where you have to get your pages back in 100 milliseconds or things like that, then you know you set it quite low. So the time I'd only be will wait. In a transaction before it times out. If you're aiming for 100 milliseconds, that's not going to help you. You're going to have to implement some sort of time rating. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> set it a lot lower than default. Um, this is where I always turn off support XA transactions unless you use XA transactions. I've only ever seen it used once. Turn it off. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, you don't agree with me up there? No. Well, you don't agree? I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what else would you talk from a, a, a um, I don't need perspective because we're going to talk about it. So. Um, I mean, they're the big ones. Yeah. 
actually file for a test or something? That's an interesting point. Um, so INODB file per table. INODB uses a table space to store all of its data and it uses redo log files to store its log logging transactions. Now, the disadvantages of using just one table, so unlike Oracle, this is a very specific thing with Oracle. With MySQL, you have, or I don't know if you have one table space only. It says 16k paper pages. You have to read the file MySQL to change the page size. You can add data files to that. You can't add data files online, by the way. And you also can't specify which tables go into which data files. It will sort of like round robin them across the, the size of your entire table space. No, I was told, this is, this is something that I've been told is different, it's been changed, yeah. So if you had, say, a, you know, 100 gig in your table space, and you had 520 gig data files, and you put them on like different disks or different spindles, something like that, um, I'd only be for what I've been told now, which is different to my original interpretation, you used to just go from the start and move forwards. But now it actually sort of like starts at zero, then it goes to 50% of the table, the table space, then 25%, then 75%. <coughs> now I don't have an answer, and the reason why I don't have an answer is because no one really knows. You have to like read the source code. That's so pretty much encourages bad behavior. Yeah. Because you can put the end of the table space files on different disks, and you lose a disk, you can't recover any of your data. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so the whole backup recovery everything comes into play. But, so there are table spaces. They're like, generally there's one table space that has data files, and that table space is for everything. All of your tables, your common data, your undo logs, all are in that table space. And one thing about, one benefit of INDB file per table, is if you like drop a table, then it'll actually just reclaim that space because it's a per file. Um, the disadvantage is that you have a lot more file handlers open, so when you like flush, you've got to like flush to all these individual files at whatever time you're doing flushing. So, it's, it's one of these, like, do you use it or not? You're going to say you use it, but it depends on how many tables you've got. When are you doing deletes? It has trade-offs, but I would say in general, you use it. You what about the time to, to have, have file handles open and sync every file every time? Yeah, if you're, if you're looking for the most performance out of the thing, it's going to hurt you. <laughs> uh, but in general, it's going to make your life easier, so it's probably worth the trade-off. The syncing of the files is dramatically helped by having a battery back to write cache, so that the answer way. comes back up all the time. Like, if you don't have a hardware array with battery back to write cache, you're spending your money in the wrong places. So, uh, I mean, spending time like working through all these issues, or, or even having a single failure where you have to recover things without that or anything like that, it's going to cost you a lot more than the hardware rate charge would. So, uh, that's worthwhile. But, um, and the thing to notice is that it is important to realize you still have to have a common table space. Common table space is used for metadata uh, and used for um, undos and so forth. And that leads me to the point of the fact that you should always set uh, additional memory size as well. If you have a reasonable number of tables, you should set uh, additional memory pool size larger because the default is one meg, I believe. So this is just an extra buffer of memory that, that INODB uses for lots of internal stuff. I have table caching, uh, it's adaptive hash indexing, and other three or four other things. Um, so I'll increase that too. Um, that'd be the key ones if you're using INODB. Do you guys have any comments on uh, Connect? Sorry, on? Inet Connect. Why? Oh, you're using memory tables. Okay. Yeah. Why are you interested? I didn't file, you mean. Why are you using memory tables is a better question. Uh, it's what complicated, but I need a little array for some certain uh, uh, types of um, multi record uh, I can I can go into the detail, but I think I did. So are they always primary key <laughs> prim they always like single inserts and single lookups? Yeah. You're always doing primary key? Because the table level locking will kill you if you don't have yeah. effectively yeah. primary key. They're, they're temporary, they're session only. Sure, but the locking, the table level locking will kill you with high rights. When I was talking before about, you know, 12, 40,000 transactions a second, but, memory tables. But if they're session only, they're only going to write lock to that session for the memory tables. And for any other locking, we're using it on the EVs. So no, a memory table is a per instance table. You're talking about create temporary table? Yes. Create temporary table, it's not a memory table. Create temporary table, we'll use the default. 
Well, with Crad Temporary Table, we'll use the default storage engine, which is generally IDB. Oh, my ISA. No, I specify memory. So okay. it's, it's a little. It's a little. So temporary is on yeah, a per session. That's a lot. How many sessions have we got? Well, we're just coming out of beta, so not many right now. So the they're, biggest problem. They're tiny, though. They're tiny. The biggest problem that you'll have with this, along with all the other memory tables, is MySQL has no concept of a PGA. Okay, it will not set a hard limit. So you can define maximum number of connections, and there's an equation of like all you know, all you can pool sizes that'll use memory. You can define the max heap table size, the maximum size that those tables can be. Um, but if you don't work with your equations right and you set variables wrong, then you can actually run out of memory because there's no way to say this is the maximum amount of memory that can be allocated in this process. And that's one limitation. You can't pin stuff into memory. Um, with the exception of my ISM page, of my ISM indexes. Jacob, there's a proposal for. Sorry, what's that? On Jacob, there's a proposal for fixing the memory mess. Memory, the memory is a huge mess. So if you start playing around with that, you've got to look at a lot. There's a whole pile of ramifications. There's a lot of limitations. I see a few applications that do similar things to that, and besides the fact that you completely destroy any ability of replicating anything from that, like. I don't know if you're using replication right now, but I've seen really bad situations from well, using those temporary tables but and replication. You want to replicate. Why would you replicate a temporary table if it's just used for local problems? <laughs> it depends on exactly what you're using it for. Yeah, I'm not going to replicate any of that stuff. I don't need to. Like I said, it depends exactly on what you're using it for, whether you use it and, and then kind of what the end result of using those temporary tables is. Basically, if you end up writing back into your real tables or anything like that, you can get into a really bad situation. But in general, uh, you, you can talk about what, you're, what exactly you're doing with them. Okay, I'll okay. be interested to hear that. It will be interesting to hear. Um, so, in the very short period of time that we have left, um, anyone from the floor want to talk about some other important variables, maybe not particularly IDB variables? Because part of this is getting input from others. Well, what does IDB do if you, when you change the log, log file size and it was set to an old one, and you restart it, it's not going to like it, right? If you shut down successfully, uh, which means you do a successful shutdown, you can remove your log files, but you, and then like you want to return to size and remove them and start it back up and it'll recreate them. Right. However, you want to make sure you definitely do a backup. Right. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, because if you have to restore because of some you know transaction loss. Maybe you should like shut down, start up and shut down again and make sure everything's clean. The process for fixing it is scary as hell. Yeah. Make sure the fast shutdown. Shut down, shut down perfectly cleanly. Delete the old log files, right. and then restart, and it will create new ones. But, but if you just shut down, change the numbers, and restart, it will actually complain about the mismatching of the actual file size. Metal files start. So we'll continue using the old file size. We'll yes. Wait. Okay. So it's really it. odd, actually. It doesn't really care what the config file says. Right. There are actually files there. Right. Right. Uh, it won't start. I don't think it won't start. Oh, it will. So is it log files are different, but if the IDB Table space. table space is different, I don't even will not start. It right. won't start right. like if you change the table space size okay. by adding log files. Did I hear you say you shut down twice? Well, I mean, to be absolutely certain that your transactions are saved, if you're going to change log files, I'll shut down. You think it's clean, but for safety, start up, shut down again. Just, just make sure that it's clean. But you don't prove anything because you should, could shut down uncleanly the second time you shut down. Yeah, yeah I don't I'm just. I'm just being, a, I'm thinking in the Oracle would be extra cautious type scenario. <laughs> do a backup before you change your log file size. Are you, are you saying that you can change the energy log file size without shutting it down? No, you can't. Yeah. No, you've got to shut down, but you've got to shut down and delete the files and start back up again. But if you shut down, you want to make sure it's clean. If it's not clean, then you've got, un you've got transactions committed in the log files that you need to replay in a crash situation. So if you have, if your MySQL crashes and it starts back up, it's going to get its data and then it's going to replay the redo logs, which are the ones that you're just going to change, you just deleted, okay, and then it's going to undo the undo transactions and then, you know, you're going to be ready to go. I actually did this last night. Uh, and uh, make sure you know to be fast shut down is in set to two, otherwise it won't actually flush things. It won't completely. There will be dirty data in the log. In general, don't touch it to be fast shut down unless you really know what you're doing. Because it will screw you in many different ways. It only be fast shutdown. So it's like, yeah, don't touch that. That's 
So when do you recommend this? So if you want to what? Class on? Going back to the temporary table discussion, what yeah. do you recommend using memory for temporary tables or am I saying? Memory can be used for temporary tables like session management, you know, at an instance level. Um, then here we're talking about create temporary table which is a per session, only that connection. So it's only staying for the life of that connection. Yep. So the light creates and destroys. Now, even though you create a temporary table, you're actually creating an underlying.frm file which is ripped to disk, so there's an F sync going there, and it's going to take a table cache file, so... Or Odirect. Well, Odirect, you're still going to write to disk. So there's because no MySQL, yeah, Odirect doesn't change anything with the FRM file. Because MySQL will still keep an internal it's, reference to that is file. There a table, there's a table cache. There is a table cache, but the table cache is like for reading of the file system. When you cre create a temporary table, we'll still actually create, we'll still, we'll still, we'll still create an internal .frm file, and it will put it on disk. So there's no way to hashes so no so so in, so in the future, do you think it would be better to have that created in memory as, memory as an option? Definitely. Well, it's going to be the same. Even a type of created in memory will still create a file on disk. But I'm saying a way to create, to offload that information in memory. Yeah, well, maybe the question is, is that why are you using MySQL to store that data? Maybe there's a better caching method. Java application level, memcache, or something like that. I mean, there could be better options for caching. It would depend on the requirements. <coughs> like if you're inserting multiple rows and then you're using some sort of select to pull back a subset of rows, well then maybe you want SQL rich syntax. So it's, you know, depends on the application. Um, and in general, I, I would say I haven't seen really compelling reasons to use <coughs> memory in, in nearly all cases. Like, it has table level locking only, which is disastrous if you want to use it as a shared table. And besides that, performance is not much better than my ISAM, provided you have buffers and such set correctly. Um, and then, with the addition, uh, you know, if using it for really, really temporary things, you still end up with writes to disk and such. So, I haven't seen very many applications where it just makes good sense. Like, moving things off the of cache, moving them elsewhere, usually helps for most things that you really would consider a cache. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's something that isn't really a cache, like session management and stuff, you know, DB would probably be a better bet for that because you get, you know, if things fit in memory, things will mostly operate out of memory. Um, so that, you know, if you're, if you don't care about the data specifically, you can set, like, uh, flush log and TRX commit to zero, sync bin log to zero, set all that stuff to zero, and basically forego data safety for, you know, extra performance, and you might even get better performance than memory. Just because of the table blocking versus row blocking issue. So, would you ever say there's a, there's a fair amount of issues where you can say, yeah, use my setting for temporary tables or use another unique for temporary tables? I don't know if there's a good way to, I mean, it's, it's partly, probably the biggest difference there would be table level locking. So, if, if you really step on table level locking, then use that other But in general, I mean, most of the applications that we work with, we just tell people to use it for everything. Yeah, if someone asked the best practice, they said, you know, what would you use the best practice? My answer would be use a transactional storage engine. Right. Yep. And, you know, if someone asked, if someone asked for three things, that would be number one. Number two would be use SQL mode. Definitely. Use, use, the second use one? SQL mode. Okay, so this is a bit of a history, this is a bit of a history lesson, but MySQL historically um, was lax in its data integrity. Okay, so you could store a value longer than what was actually defined, it was silently truncated, you could put a number that's too large, it would size, size it down, do things like that. Using SQL mode, you can set it into various different settings. You're talking about strict, strict, ANSI, traditional, I'd probably run all three of those together. Um, and you could, uh, and that'll definitely improve your integrity. Uh, if you're ex-Oracle people, for example, they even have like an or a mode called Oracle, which Ironically, it doesn't have everything in it, which is Oracle. That's sort of stupid. Um, but, you know, so, so um, uh, you know, there's all these modes, you can string them together. So there's like ANSI, uh, traditional, uh, you know, don't allow, use ANSI quotes. If you start messing with some of these things, be aware that MySQL, other products might not like you. So, uh, you know, use, con you know, Oracle's like, use concat, the, the pipe signs. Use concat, use concat as pipes. That's great, but then it breaks other things like, for example, you know, MySQL work, um, the um, work bench, 
Uh, the toolkit for migration, you go, this is cool, I've set it because that's what I want to use the syntax. And you've got to use the migration program and it breaks because it's wanting to use the MySQL syntax. So some of these things, like there's good ones like, you know, don't let you create a user without a password. Um, there's like a million of them you can sort of see here. Down the bottom, Oracle equates to pipes as concat, as quotes, ignore space, and these sorts of things. And it doesn't have in there traditional, you know, so. What, what's the default for SQL model? Uh, it, it has no default. The default is, is that it's just the normal MySQL operations. So if, if, if I all of a sudden switch it to ANSI... If you, start, if you switch it to ANSI and you're running some old LAMP stack product, it will break. But what about is going to throw errors like on uh, mixed collation for concatenates and things like that? Can you write much short procedures by restarting? No. The, the biggest problem that you're going to have is if you change it, it's going to go, rather than throwing a warning, which you always throw warnings away, it's going to throw an error to say, if you try to insert 51 characters in a field to find it's 50 characters long, it'll throw an error. Okay, which is actually better for you to have for integrity. Okay. Well, especially so, for handling. Yeah, especially for handling. So, um, defining SQL mode, and I would go, I would always do traditional, it's pipe, isn't it? Is it pipe? Traditional. I think we we'll have the syntax, so I forget these things. To be more important? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was pipe. Yeah. Might be cool. um, so, it, so you're saying um, use strict trans tables as well? <coughs> <coughs> is that what you said? You said you strict. Strict. There's no actual strict. <coughs> strict. Yeah, is not that? strict. I thought it was a strict all tables. Strict all tables are strict trend tables. Oh, yeah, they changed the names of it. So I would definitely go with ANSI. I think strict and trans works. And, trans and traditional. I think strict oh, sorry. is still no, easy not, Sorry, not, trans not transitional. ANSI and... Um, Traditional is the one to make operate like it used to be. Um, throw me a warning. Um, oh, come on. And, and, um, oh, we'll, I'll so, look it up. Actually, on the storage and discussion, um, the reason mostly that we say use NODB for everything is that for a lot of things, you really need NODB. And if you start mixing storage engines, you're going to get a lot of really weird edge cases that you don't want to work with. You, you lose the ability to have full text indexes. You should be using Lucene anyway. Um, you, know, you lose the ability to do a couple of other minor things, but there are replacements for all of that. Um, so you gain simplicity and backup and recovery. You, you gain so much. Like There's so many weird cases around replication and multiple storage engines and recovery and backups and everything where you just don't want to have to deal with all of that. If you put everything in NLDB, it's always consistent with itself. Um, and and you won't lose transactional integrity. Even if you set things such that you lose data, you at least won't lose the integrity of the transactions. And recovery will be very simple and all of that. So if you ever have you know, 300 gig worth of my ISO tables and you have a power failure of the machine, then you quickly realize why you know, it would have been a good idea. Because you'll have to manually recover 500 gig worth of data Wait. running a repair table. And you're saying even if there are, what if there are tables you don't care about recovery on? You're supposed to use NDB where you, you're just... Yeah, I mean, you still have to recover them, right? So this, it's, this, it's this introduces an interesting debate. If you're like logging data, like straight inserts, not updating, not deleting it, uh, and you're logging lots of it, you're talking like, you know, you're logging like 100 meg of it a month, then NDB may not be the best solution for you. You need a better strategy. In fact, because, it's not. Because, it take, because NLDB will take three times as much disk space as storing it in my ISAF. The biggest penalty is exactly what Jeremy said. In recovery time, you have to check those tables. And if you want to do a check on a 100 gigabyte my ISAF table, it's going to take you like, depending on your disk, it might take you half an hour. If you have several of them, it's going to take a long time. How fast is this stuff? Half an hour. Actually, I don't think of it. No, actually, kind of think of it ten, actually, 10 gig is about, 10 gig on slow local disk is like 10 minutes, so, yeah, yeah. But no, three times the speed, um, yeah, okay, well, maybe it might, it might take... Just to check it. Just to check it, not to recover it, just to check it. You end up having to repair it, that would take ages. Yeah, so these are huge scale-up things, this is backup recovery, but that's when you wouldn't use IDB, um, when you've got lots of data being written once off, you want to put it somewhere else, uh, and manage it appropriately. You know, might want to have aggregated information that you store in NDB um, because NDB has a much larger disk footprint. Than two disk. On purpose, in fact, it will waste lots of space on purpose. Yeah, and the reason why is because it allocates for its 
we can spend the whole time talking about the allocation of 15 sixteenths of a 16k page. But let's not drill down to that. There's only three of us that understand what we're talking about. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, query quick text size. At one point you said uh, uh, good for high read, uh, bad for high write. Okay, let me explain to you how the query cache works. Um, uh, let me actually pull up something and then get it critiqued. What I was leading to ask actually is, is there sort of a, a, some silver, silver bullets for, uh, for high read? We've talked a lot about high write. Um, the better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was saying, so, so um, the, thing about, the thing about query, let's just talk about query cache because it's, it's a worthwhile discussion for that point. Query cache is really good because MySQL, um, this is actually a bad diagram, let me just pull up this diagram because I've got a better one here. Hey, have you worked on that MySQL proxy or anything you want? Yeah, no, I'm still working on that. Good. Um, oops. What did I do? Oops. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of like alternate reality. No, it's sort of it's sort of like it went into like a um, slideshow. So here is a um, here is an old diagram, but the thing is that what this is trying to describe is is that if you use the query cache, the application comes in and it does a little pre parse to see if you're working on a select statement. And if it's a select statement, it checks the query cache first. Because if it finds your exact match on the query, which is why it's very important that your uh, one of these points that I have here somewhere. Um, sorry for flicking people, but you know this is life. Um, oh, I must be on the same slide. Um, so um, the thing about the thing about the query cache, it will check your SQL syntax <coughs> byte for byte. So if you're writing SQL statements and you think it's the same on one page to the next page then you refactor it because it's not the same query cache won't actually use it. Even a space? Even a space. It's comparing bytes to bytes. So always abstract your SQL statements out into include files or whatever else. You know, write well-formed SQL statements. It's actually not so much comparing byte for byte. It's MD5 query. It's, it's, doing, it's, doing, it's, doing, it's doing a strict string comparison. Yeah, well, you'd be able to know better exactly what it's doing than I would. Um, Basically, MD5 is the query string. That's the hash key for the result. Mm. And so if it finds it in the query cache, which then stores preformed network packets, it just sends it back to the client. It's that fast. The penalty for query cache is, is that if you have a table, let's say, you know, users, okay, and it's in there, and like someone's like pulling back a list of users, that's fine. As soon as you make one change to that table, one insert, one update, or one delete, it will invalidate every query cache object that has reference to that table. It's very blunt force. And there are no overrides. There's no, no overrides. There's no control. You've got no control of the granularity. So it does flushing everything out of the cache. So it does actually look at which tables are referenced. Yeah. In yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it stores in the cache several things. Basically it's, it's stored by there's actually two hashes into the data. There's one for the query string itself, which is the MD5 basically as a hash key. And the other is a uh, hash of the table name itself and which entries reference that table. So whenever you touch, whenever you write to any of, whenever you write to any table actually, it's going to check the query cache to see if there are any cache entries to invalidate for that table and then invalidate all of them. Instead of, uh, instead of hashing the query string, string, instead of hashing the query string, could you hash the uh, optimized or normalized something? Kind of if there were such a thing, yes. Numbers? Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's, that's the point. So the reason why I'm doing this diagram the reason why I look at this diagram is because the query cache sits in front of the parser in front of the optimizer. Okay, and one of the reasons which is interesting here is that from an Oracle perspective here, every query goes through a query execution plan. Every single time. And we have also got in here security, there's a security check because every query checks for security as well. Because you can change the permissions on a table for a user and then the next query that they hit, the permissions are in effect. Okay. Um, so, so the benefit of query cache, great. Okay, for high read, for high read environments, if the changes are low, it writes. So disadvantage if you start doing more and more writes to the table because you just lose the benefit. Query cache has an overhead for every query that it processes. Okay, you can control the granularity of what can go into the query cache by defining the variables being. Uh, you can define it as on or off or on demand. So you could say, because by default it's going to look at a query, it's an SQL statement, and as long as it's less than the size that you allocate for the maximum amount to put in there, like there's a query cache 
size of the limit, which is like one meg. So anything that's bigger than one meg, it won't add it to the query page. So if it's less than that, it will add it. The results. You know. You'll add the results, yes, you'll add the results. The results have to be less than yeah. So you can actually sort of say run in demand mode, which means you have to tell MySQL via a hint that you want to put this in the query cache. Um, but again, it's an overhead. So quite often, um, uh, the trick with, um, so here you have query cache type 0, 1 or 2, query cache size, query cache limit. Um, and um, sometimes it's actually best to turn it off. And in fact, if I was test in a test environment where we're talking to people about testing and benchmarking, I recommend turn it off. You should start with it turned off and then you might turn it on and see whether it improves. No, no just yell out, Sherry, no need to. Well, you also want to make sure that um, you have the, if you don't have, if your size is too small and stuff like that and you just kind of turn it on, yeah. you're going to add lots and lots of slowness. Yeah, so it's particularly worthwhile also looking at the show status like query cache because it will give you a whole pile of variables, things like how many ones are being flushed from the query cache. You can also look at query cache hits versus your selects to see what your query cache hit ratio is. Um, and so this is a good segue into, you know, why people use memcache. Because memcache gives you that finer granularity, it gives you your TTY on your data, uh, things like that. Oh, time to life, TTL, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Is the, is time the, to life. Is that a question? Is, is, it, ever yeah, okay, is, it, fine. is it ever possible for two different strings to um, MD5 hash at the same time? It's, it's very, very unlikely. Is it the way to handle this by comparing the query string Broken. once the hash is pulled back? I think, I think the way that it works is that Basically, the query, well, cache can be, the query cache can be aborted at any point in time. So I think the way that it works is if there's an entry in the cache that has a hash value of what we're trying to insert, but the query string does not match, then it doesn't count. So it matches both the MD5 so sum and the... only one query that has this, a particular hash value could be stored. If you find two strings that hash to the same MD5, then already you should out. publish it. Publish it. That would be yeah, huge. Yeah. 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 It's very, very, very low, yeah. but it is possible in theory. No, but it's like possible like, like one out of like two one to one twenty-eight. Ten to the sixty. Yeah, some, some yeah. Well, that's, well, that's no, no. Yeah. That's the possibility yeah. of two random strings. Yeah. This isn't a random string. Yeah. yeah. There's a certain language to a query, so that's why it's a lot more. Oh, look, that's the stuff. That's not talking about simple. Um, we're going to spend a break for lunch because we're going to talk about backup strategies. Um, and the reason why I say that is because we can spend all that time talking about configurations. Because um, after lunch, we were just talk, we're talking about storage engines and we mentioned it. Um, different storage engines really affect the backup strategy. So um, why don't we break for lunch very quickly, grab some food, come back, and we can start talking about this. What, I'm going to, what I've got here for slides is backups takes you from the most basic backup strategy and moves through them. Okay, so this is beginner stuff. And we'll go through five different ways, four or five different ways to do backups. And we'll discuss the pros and cons. And then we'll also talk about, you know, why you would use replication and what the issues are of using replication to be backups as well. More than right backups. So this is important, and I blogged about this last week because there are sites out there that don't do backups. Properly. They do straight <laughs> copies. And I will just pull that slide up right now. We'll see um, the customers. Uh, yep, yeah, customers that just copy the data. Um, and so you know which sites not to get any of our important data. <laughs> so why do you not use a copy? The data isn't consistent in the backup. If your backup takes five minutes to copy the files, and it copies them in chronological order from A to Z, if it even does that, if you're writing data into like the A table, you know, the table that starts with A, and you back up that file and you're writing data and then later, you know, you back up the file that says Z, it's not consistent between the files. Um, my ISAM indexes are not flushed, we talked about the recovery time. Um, if you, my ISAM crashes, then the time it takes to recovery could be long and it may not even recover. And INODB will auto recover <coughs> if we do long. However, there are instances and we'll talk about this. Far, we'll talk about that later about when that doesn't work. Um, so basically, you just don't use copy on a running database. I'll explain after lunch how you use copy. There's there's actually one engine that you can use copy on. A CSV. Exactly. Who here uses CSV <laughs> storage engine? Nobody. <laughs> End of discussion. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, but you know, the the point the point is you don't copy a file like that unless it's you know not being written to or it's you know plain text. Or, with the same caveat that the end of the name file will be very So what we just talked about, I'll just put a note in here to say, um, I'll put a little thing in notes um, to be edited, but I'll publish this so that those people can see it, what we just talked about generally. And then please, if you wrote something down at the start of the session, then put it into MySQL configuration file, or email it to me, or IRC it, or something.